Right. Well, let me introduce to the stage some people you've met already this weekend if you've been with us, and one person you haven't. First of all, Mr. Ramsey Campbell, who's going to be hosting this session. Give him a round of applause. What do I do now? Oh, I, I can do that. Um, uh, Mr. Neil Marshall. Yeah. Is it Garris? And last but by no means least, Rich Shearsmith. <laughs> Just before we kick off, there are two things I want to say. When you hold this mic, please hold it below this knobbly bit, because that's recording you as well. Uh, and also, just before we kick off, Reese, something we wanted to show you last night at the beginning of the thing, and we didn't manage to, so we're just going to play it for you now. For the surprise! So, uh, guys, if you could roll BT, okay? How are we doing up there? <laughs> Come on, Simon! <laughs> Roll that. <laughs> oh, no sound! No sound! I do hope you enjoyed seeing the thing again on the big screen. It's hard to believe that it's 40 years old this year. I'm also excited to see how much love there is still for a movie that old. It's a testament to the movie that it endures and would seem that people still love it. Reese. Thanks again, and thank you for choosing The Thing as your favorite monster movie. Record. I mean, I know you know who all these guys are. In case anybody up there is thinking, who the bloody hell is this? Um, I'm Ramsey Campbell, a right horror. First saw print 60 years ago, but I've also written extensively on, on the movies. Uh, did a column in Video Watchdog for years, which is now Collectors Ramsey's Rambles. And just recently delivered an over 70,000 word monograph on The Three Stooges. So that, that, those are my conversations. So, American Werewolf, and werewolves generally, and monsters generally. Um, it seems to me that the, the werewolf movie, and I suppose particularly the Universal Pictures werewolf movie, is a kind of continuing dialogue uh, with, a, with, a, with an invented legend. Uh, obviously, in this case, you know, and in The Howling, when I remember it, uh, you know, you specifically refer to the Wolfman, Lon Chaney Jr., but in fact, that's preceded by the Werewolf of London, uh, in which uh, Henry Hole, uh, you, you got two werewolves for the price of one. And in that, it's the werewolf kills the person he most loves. Now, Kurt Siodmak comes along and reverses that in The Wolfman, and it's, you know, the person who most loves you will kill the Wolfman. He also puts in the five-pointed star, and I think we might come to that later on in the discussion. Um, and other elements. And this film, American Werewolf, then proceeds you know, to jettison much of that legend. You don't need silver bullets, and um, basically, you don't need the person who loves you. In fact, they're, they're no good at all. They're use. I mean, you expect Jenny Agatha to have some sort of redemptive function within the film. 
I suppose that the, 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 what we have to say is you have to take a tragic function. Um, so far, so good. Let me pass it on to you guys for thoughts. Well, I just got, I just got one question. Um, is anybody seeing it for the first time today? Well, lucky you. There's <laughs> <laughs> two. Yeah. yeah it's been wicked. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good. And, and great to see it on the big screen for the first time as well. What, what was your first time when you saw the movie? Um, first time I saw it was sadly on VHS. Oh. Um, Ouch. Uh, I, was too, I was too young to see it at the cinema when it first came out. And uh, yeah, I saw it on VHS for the first time. And I, I, remember, I, mean, I must have been like 12 maybe. But what I do remember about the first time was that I didn't get the comedy really at all. Uh, maybe, maybe some of the slapstick stuff is pretty obvious, but I was so shit scared by it the first time I saw it, and then it was like on well, the second time you started to really, really appreciate it. By the 23rd, <laughs> 20th, 30th time, I don't know how many, I've lost count how many times I've seen it now, but um, you see something new every time, and that's just amazing. I think I saw it on either BBC Two or Channel Four. So I, I was 11 years old, and I, I remember specifically because we were on holiday, my family, my mum and dad would take us always to Cornwall camping and they'd stop off at a place called Exmoor. And it just happened that the first time I saw American Wealth in London, we stayed the night in this family farmhouse in the middle of the moor. <laughs> exactly. We'd been playing hide and seek in, up until dusk. And we went into this like stone kitchen and there was this giant um, old English sheepdog that was terrifying. Huge. We would always like come and pound at the door. And me and my friend Frank were like in these bright red sleeping bags. And I remember it vividly because there was a small television in the kitchen and we sort of snuck it on at night. And I didn't know, you know, when you're little you don't know what, um, we didn't know what an American world in London was. Never heard of it. We didn't know when I was too young. We watched that opening and we saw these two guys in these bright puff jackets and they just read. And, I, and, and we didn't know what it was and they were chatting and it was sort of like, you know, and then that first like, that kind of distant howl, and, and it, it was just like it was outside in the moor where we were, and, I, and then suddenly this brutal attack, and it just, you know that queasy feeling you get, you know, it gave me that sick queasy feeling like hiding in his sleeping bag, but the sleeping bag was defenceless because it was just like a puffer jacket, it just <laughs> fascinated. that shot of his sort of naked body with like, you know, punctuations in, anyway, so it was a real, like, vivid start. Um, I can't, I think I must have seen it on video, I was not too young to see it in the cinema, but I, it was again oh, that, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it being terrifying, and, and it's, I think probably the first example in, that I can think of where I was afraid for the people because it felt so real, and their reactions to the to being scared on the moors. I've never felt anything like it because it was like, that's what it would be like. La la la, I'm walking along uh, and hearing the noise of the werewolf coming out. Shit, David, what is that? And it was just felt really, I'd never seen acting like it, that punctuated, it just completely connected with me. It's like, never mind all these gothic horrors that I've obviously loved forever, but this is what it would actually be like if you were in the dark with the noise surrounding. And, and I thought, and that really just connected with me as a, as a proper, true horror, it was very frightening. And um, yeah, and same as, as Neil, I never really got the comedy, I just thought it was terrifying. But um, bit by bit, I've got, obviously over the years, I've realized how brilliantly Landis is, and it's so screwball in some places. I mean, I mean it's so funny, I mean, actually, I mean, it's, he knows what he's doing. With that, that. And, and an amazing depiction we were talking earlier about of, of Britain. How did Landis get it? I mean, he's such an anglophile, but he completely gets it, yeah? Well, I was lucky enough, and this is an old story now, to have worked on it. Uh, and done You've publicity. done <laughs> And did publicity on it. I also have a cameo in The Howling, so speaking of werewolf. And in Thriller, right? Well, yes, and in Thriller as well. Is this one? Yeah, it is on. Can, you, can everyone hear us? Yeah. But uh, I was lucky enough to go see... Well, first of all, Landis was hugely successful as a comedy director. He'd never made a horror movie. I mean, Schwab, his first movie was a monster comedy, but it wasn't scary at all. It was a comedy. So this was a real gamble, and it was not made by a studio. It was made independently. Um, and then Universal picked it up for distribution. 
So it was made very cheaply for a studio-sized film. It was a $10 million movie at the time. But I got to go to a test screen, and I hadn't seen the film, I'd read the script and all, but to see it with an audience who had no idea, they'd never heard of it before. And so they went in fresh, but it was an American crowd, and the, the comedy worked like gangbusters, and, and John is such a master at defusing you with laughs before scaring the shit out of you and ripping the shit out of Griffin Dunn. Uh, but when you just, just tiny things like what Rick Baker did with the little dangling bit of flesh when Griffin Dunn's character is talking, it's intentional and it's itsy bitsy. And it's, and it's both ew and ooh at the same time. So, but was that the same version that we saw today that you saw the preview? Yeah, it was unchanged because ah. it was such a successful sneak preview. Uh huh. Because, because as I read it, um, originally the the love scene was more explicit. Orlandis wanted it to be more explicit, and certainly the killing of the three homeless guys apparently was much more graphic. But I think it was. Uh, it may have been studio input, but I, I think it was more likely that the graphicness of the murder of the homeless guys was distracting mm, from yeah. the propulsion of the story. A bit like the, the spider pit in Kong, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And well, just just for the record, I mean, I, I, I first saw it at a press show in Liverpool, so I saw it on its original release on a, on a, a, a big Odeon screen, bigger than this one, actually, so that was that was an experience. And yeah, again, well, I had read a bit about it in Cine Fantastique, so I was a bit prepared, but uh, but not not that much. You can't be that prepared until you've seen it. Um, now this thing, uh, I think, Reese, you were saying about about the sense of Britain, right? Um, which was something I was going to come on to. I mean, in, a, in one sense, it's a bit as if a, a a Hammer film, you know, given East Proctor and the whole slaughtered lamb pub scene, has invaded contemporary Britain, is it not? It's spilled out into <laughs> In, into the Britain where, you know, you, you've actually sketched in, you've got, you know, the, 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 the moneyed folk are having this, this, this dinner party with champagne or whatever it is, and in the middle, you know, Jenny Agatha trying to survive on her income as a nurse, and on the riverbank, on the embankment, the homeless, so you've, you've, you've got the, the whole sense of 80s Britain, really, have you not? Um, it's, it's not the, I mean, obviously not the first, because I mean, Night of the Living Dead and things of that say have preceded it, but it's certainly, is it not the first horror movie, it's not quite the first horror movie to bring the werewolf into contemporary life, is it? There's a Fred F. Sears movie, The Werewolf, in fact, in which, ah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, it's a very strange movie, it sort of conflates the, the atomic monster threat with the universal monster conventions, because I mean, what was this poor old guy, it's actually, it's more, it's, it's more like, in a way, like Lucy's the Damned. He's, he's created as a will, on, but by these two, um, well, the sort of scientists that we see in movies like this, uh, who have decided there's going to be an apocalypse, the only people who are going to survive are werewolves, or words to that effect, you know, mutants. So they make him into a mutant. But at the end, the, the local sheriff in this totally contemporary town says, you know, let's go and, and, and the, the, the town shall all go out with flaming torches. And there's this kind of lame explanation saying, well, it might scare him off. But really, you know, we sort of slip back into universal. There's this strange conflation of, you know, the, the traditional horror movie and the modern in, in certainly in American werewolf. Um, it's why it works so well. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, of course, the, the, the story is, wasn't it, that it was too, the, the, the backers or the potential backers said, you know, basically, uh, you know, it's, it's too scary for a comedy and, and too funny for a, a horror movie, and the, which is why it took them 10 years to set up. And yet, one thing that did strike me a bit was that not that many people here today were actually laughing that much, do you think? Um, which is not, I mean, it's not a, a reflection on anything or anyone, not the movie, nor the audience, obviously. But it, it, I think it's, a, it's one of the, early, the earliest films to, to conflate horror and comedy. It's not comic relief. Well, I guess you do have the two policemen, or the one policeman, the sort of Stan Laurel policeman. I think that's pretty well pointed out with the Laurel and Hardy comic, actually, you know. Uh, and his great routine with the dishes, and the metal dishes. Um, and, yet he's, and yet, in a way, he's the policeman who's on the ball. He knows that, you know, he, he believes to some extent that, that maybe something of this 
He just doesn't, he's not able to, to make his point clearly or, or forcefully enough. One thing about this movie is, unlike most genre movies until that time, you don't spend half of the movie trying to convince people that it's real. Mm, mm. We are shown the reality of it right up front. He gets ripped to shreds by a werewolf, and you know it takes a little while for David to learn what's going on, but there's not an hour of plodding around with policemen and plodding around with doctors and, and how can this possibly be. And, but the joie de vivre of this, it, it was very competitive because <coughs> Landis wrote this when he was 19 years old. And it took 10 years for him to get it made. And he and Rick Baker had plotted these makeup effects that were groundbreaking and never done before. And then Rick Baker, because they kept getting a red light and a red light, and Rick Baker agreed to work with Joe Dante on the album. And so, John got the green light, and Rick said, well, I'm busy with the howling. He said, you bastard! How can you do this? And that is what John would do. <laughs> Reese knows well. Um, and so that's how Rob Bottin got the job to do the howling, because he was an assistant. He worked under the Rick Baker. Yeah, and so so they have these two competing werewolf movies, both in 1981, with the, the, uh, the transformation effects that had never been done before. And if I remember correctly, because I think this film's so unique, so special, so still groundbreaking. And one of the factors, I think, is when a director gets a certain point in their career. And I, am I right thinking that he had just done Animal House? Uh, he had done the Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers, sorry. Yeah. Blues Brothers, exactly. And so he had this mega smash and could do almost anything next. But instead of you know, continuing to do some studio picture, he did the movie that he wanted to do for 10 years. It was this you know, wealth movie that he hadn't been able to make previously and was able to actually execute something like that <coughs> with these, you know, the effect sequences that took days and days and days. That is why we sort of see it on that screen. Because it's only, you know, like, like the thing, you know, just, it's that commitment to being able to achieve that level that then lives on forever. And the thing was only one year later. Mm -hmm. and, and although they, they um, and although the howling kind of beat it to the cinemas by a couple of months or something yeah. like that, wasn't it? But then the history of it is that they invented an Oscar category just for this movie. Mm -hmm. The very first Oscar for makeup was given to Rick Baker. Yeah, and maybe so. And Rick Let me ask this now, just as a general thing. Um, I mean, you know, I could expand on this if you want me to, but. What do we make of the Jewish element in the in the, in the American werewolf? Landis is Jewish, mm -hmm. and he, he brought it in. He, he brought his youth into it—a backpacking Jewish kid with his buddy, mm -hmm. and bringing in the Nazism and all that. Yes. You know, that's all—it's all part of Landis's personality. Yeah. And anyone who's met him, and everyone up here, yeah. knows that he's a bigger than life character. Mm -hmm. And what comes in here goes out here. And, and, and so to maybe share that because this one's not good. Yeah. Oh, oh this, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll speak this. Right. Yes, I pity you. Sorry, you yeah, 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 yeah. sound point to me, no one else can. Because I gather, because I gather, he wrote it whilst uh, I know he was working on Kelly's yeah. Heroes. So he wrote it after he essentially toured Europe himself. So it was very kind of autobiographical from the point of view. Especially the one. Yeah, yeah. I, I screened American Wealth on Halloween last year, and John kindly did an intro live on Zoom in my little local cinema. They immediately agreed to sort of beam in, and one of the stories, or he told this great 10 minute story of, I think, when, as you were saying, when he was doing Kelly's Heroes, he was in Europe, and he saw this, I think, this. Uh, Funeral that was happening, uh, and he and he had this idea of the that they would bury them just at the side of the road. I think if I'm correct, and, and he had this idea but for American Wealth of this funeral and this body just coming back to life, like uh, in in Europe. But and and just going to that England setting, I think for me as well, it was you'd, we'd grown up on a lot of American movies and American heroes in America, and sort of having it suddenly just be really real in our. I live in the countryside, it just all felt very real and having these American heroes who also just are getting kind of cut up and destroyed before us was just really just brought it all down. Like <laughs> <laughs> but 
but also, and, and I didn't understand any of the Jewishness in, in it in, until I was a lot older, but that the whole Nazi attack, now I can kind of get what it was about, but um, obviously that whole, I have never seen that double dream sequence scare done before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Where, in many ways. Yeah, you get the massive shock of it and the intense violence, and then you go, oh, everything's yeah, so just a driller! <laughs> so yeah. I just want to show you my, John got me these. My slaughtered lamb socks. There they are. I barely, I've never worn them, but now with no better day than to wear them. You're really sure there was seven. I have, yeah. You're really sure there was seven foot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two feet, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, the it, it's so visceral, and, and those uh, dream sequences, it, it, when he's um, sort of hallucinating and being himself through the woods, so haunting and, and um, brilliant, and I don't think I'd seen anything like that either. Sort of um, a depiction of a, a living, a waking nightmare, or just the, the hallucinatory, the juxtaposition of the hospital bed in the woods. I've never. It takes your breath away, and even now, when he wakes up and he's got that horrible white face and the teeth and the eyes, and the sound is, is brilliant. I've, you hear it all the time now with sort of monster movies and, and squealing and not roaring like lions in the mouths of werewolves. But this was the sort of first time for me that that all hit home and was was brought together in something that just felt so real in the world. And to see it in London and to have Yorkshire Moors and, and Brian Glover in there as well, which is, it, would, it just felt all so um, true. And the performances again, completely real and believable. And their friendship. Griffin Dunn and, and David Norton, it's, it's brilliant and it's so, um, it's so moving as well. You, you sort of feel the, the agony of, of him being awake with the, the undead. And that, apparently that, um, the porno cinema, John said usually it was, it used to be um, Cartoon House, yeah. And I think it was going to be that originally, but you changed it to the porno for See You Next Wednesday to come back up, yeah. Of course you do, Mick. <laughs> Not in that film, eh? <laughs> well, but the other thing to remember about this that people rarely bring up is Elmer Bernstein's score. It's so special and so grand and so emotional. And it's a very straight score. It's not a horror score. Yeah, it's not, yeah. and and the people in it are played for real. They're, they're two friends on the moors walking and, and backpacking and, and their chatter is believable and completely composed and, and you know, like two friends would be. Mm -hmm. And everything in it plays so much more real. And there's also, it's less civilized than a Hammer film. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's a very American quality that John brings to everything he does. <laughs> um, and it, it's just, it's so special and it's unlike anything else before or since. Because I, I saw that uh, John hosted a night at Elmer's Music at the Royal Albert Hall, and he played, uh, the orchestra played, because he insisted on doing it, he said, I've got to score the transformation scene. And John was like, I'm not going to use it. Because <laughs> he always, always had it in his mind that it would be to Blue Moon, but it, it's a beautiful, amazing, the full works of that transformation scene, scored in that, with, with complete orchestra, and it's brilliant. You can hear it, I think you can get it online, you can hear it. But yeah, check it out, it's great. No, I was just going to say that I think, so, I think especially in the UK, we've took, taken this film very much to heart. Um, and it's so ingrained in our culture now that we know stuff from it. I remember watching The Fast Show, and there's an episode there where like, two, two, two tourists are, are going to a petrol station in the middle of nowhere, and a character pops up and says, that's enough! And, like, and you know exactly what it is, and this is like you know, 10 years after the film. Um, and I was, I was saying, I was, I, was, I was driving through the Brecon Beacons years ago, just driving through the Brecon Beacons on my way somewhere, and crossing this moor somewhere, and I just, like suddenly slammed on the brakes and pulled the car over, and I was like, I've been here before, I know this place. And I got out of the car and I looked around and suddenly realised it was the crossing at the beginning of the movie. Oh, wow. It was where they pulled up in the sheep thing. I was like, how, do, how did I know that? And, and yet there it was. And it was like, oh shit, I'm at the beginning of American Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go and find the slaughtered lamb now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, it's, just, it's, it's, all, it's all trapped in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, just, just to, pick, to, to return briefly to the Jewish thing, I mean, uh, yeah, as, as you said, it's the, the, you know, the, the double nightmare. I, you, know, you can read sort of, you know, the nightmare doesn't end in, in, in another sense too. And now I'm, I'm one of these guys, I don't know about anybody else on the panel in the audience, you know, who, uh, if you get the newspaper on screen, my eye always goes down past what you're supposed to read to the rest of it, and it's nearly always you know, surreally irrelevant, you know, because they haven't bothered mocking up the entire page. But here, and this may again just be an absolute coincidence, I find it kind of interesting that what's beneath it is a story about the rise of the new National Front. So, if you haven't spotted that before, no, next time you, next time you see the movie, I know you're going to see it again, uh, check, check that out. But it, it seems to me, again, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm being um, too analytical here, but, you know, the very fact that we see them being turned out from among sheep in, the, in their first appearance in screen. Is this not the scapegoat? Is that not what the monster is in this movie, in a way? I mean, for what? I'm not sure. I mean, that would, that's a matter of discussion. But maybe I could sort of open this out. Uh, well, actually, Neil, this would be us before we, I open this a bit further. I mean, do, did you feel sort of in dialogue with, with the werewolf tradition in Dog Soldiers? Uh. Well, yeah, to a point, but it's, I think it's one of those things that so much of the werewolf tradition has come from the movies that we've seen, and you kind of, as Landis did, you kind of pick and choose which bits you want to use or don't. Because um, I, I, you know, when I was researching Dog Soldiers, not obviously, clearly, I was like massively inspired by this and the Howling, but I was also reading the, you know, the, the, uh, the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould's Book of Werewolves, uh, which was written many, 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 many years ago. Um, and, and it was that thing of like you just take whatever mythology kind of works for the for the story really. Um, I tried not to get too bogged down by it because my whole thing was not about the curse of the werewolf so much. Um, but I did bring in you know silver and stuff like that. I kind of, I kind of like that element, so I kept that. But yeah, you know, otherwise it's just like you know pick and choose. Yeah, it's kind of crucial that in your film, you know, whereas ordinarily, certainly in the 50s movies in particular, you know, the army would show up at the end and destroy the monster. The, the army is pretty well the monster, which, you know, is, is, a, is a, a, again, a move forward and, and one suspects an ominous one too, actually, you know. So, I mean, I mean Mick, you, you, now, apart from working on The Howling, um, you, you've been involved with like Cansby, have you not? Not personally, but uh, in terms of creation. Well, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's all about the transition from person to monster. When when I made Sleepwalkers, that was the, the same part of it. You know, it's it's it all is rooted in Jekyll and Hyde and Robert Louis yeah. Stevenson, because we all have a monster within us, and it, sometimes it takes more for it to be unleashed for some of us than for others. But that duality, the Descartes kind of element of of who we are and who we might be and are capable of being is is a pretty potent part of the werewolf mythos that even in Sleepwalkers they were, wear cats, I guess. Um, but it, it still comes from the same root in place. Thoughts on monsters? Um, well, monsters, that's what we're here to talk about, isn't it? And um, I mean, it is in the greatest monster movies of all time. I really was inspired by that balance of the way emotion is it, it's actually that the movie moves so efficiently and it always kind of gets me you can settle into it and you forget that last sort of insane carnage in the last 10 minutes mm -hmm. and it, it just takes you on this ride from when they go to the cinema and then and then every time it, when he's when she's running down the alley saying David it, you son I get really overwhelmed with emotions like, oh shit not only is it the, the end of the film but what's just about to happen I always forget what's about to happen and how this like tragic love story, you know, this sort of Romeo and Juliet moment of you know their union and not being allowed to have it. And and I and when I was working on my first film, The Hallow, absolutely the monster effects and the practical effects, I was sort of dedicated to trying to pull a transformation off, but also make it feel painful in that way. I've never seen that sort of absolute agony that. He goes through, yeah, bones extending and, and, and combining that with this sort of tragic love story was really important too. Yeah, and I think the, the takeaway for me as a, a went on to sort of do dark comedy horror 
this was the first one that did it to me successfully for in or certainly in, as a, a flag in the sand of it can you can do it brilliantly and it's it's not easy to do because you can fail it but on both counts on it can be a cure at take and I think John is a uh, master at it. He does a lot. I said to him, "What's your?" He said, "If I have one thing, I think I do to get the comedy." He said, "It's always reaction shots," and, and that's an interesting take. So I was watching it again with that in mind today. But um, yeah, he's a, he's a true master of, like Mick said, of sort of pulling the rug from under you and then, but allowing. And it's not. I mean, there are some bits in it that are pure. John loves Laurel and Hardy, and you can absolutely see it, of course, in the depiction of the two policemen. And, what are they called? Villiers and something else? I can't remember the name. It's Villiers and somebody, but that, yeah. And apparently the other policeman that picks up all the, the dishes, he's a playwright. He went on to be a quite famous playwright, yeah. He's brilliant in that part. Because they're really not on screen very long, but they completely sell that double act. And, and those moments are so brilliantly done, it's, it, it's delicious to watch it. There's so much of it through John Woodvine's straight face reactions to us. Because it's the way that he shifts tones, but like the, as you say, there's their kind of bumbling idiot comedy plays off John Woodvine's playing a dead straight, and he's wonderful in the movie. But I think the shift of tone, especially at the end, where you're literally like in tears for Agatha because she's so brilliant in the film, and it's so sad, and then he suddenly cuts to the really cheerful version of Blue Moon for the end credits, like just when you're thinking, oh, this is sad, no, nope, boom, we're off on a song. Um, I, I love that sudden shift; it's great. And it should be pointed out that very few horror comedies are either funny or scary. You know, to try to do both is a very, very difficult tightrope to walk. And this does it, this, and amazingly, The Howling did the same thing, but they are horror movies that are funny and not comedies that are horrific. Uh, I guess, I mean, I suppose, um, I think that I, I suppose I'd, I'd venture the, James Whale as the first to, yeah. to, to, to put them together and not necessarily as comic relief because I mean there are lots and lots of gags in right. Bride of Frankenstein for sure and I mean I'm, for the record I've always argued that the Bride of Frankenstein is Dr. Pretorius you know uh, basically he you know, seduces <laughs> old uh, you know, Frankenstein away from his wife and they go off and create life together um, the Invisible Man, or indeed, actually, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is when when Colin Clive is told, you know, in Frankenstein, they put the wrong brain in. He does this kind of classic double take, you know, which is it, it's it again is a it's 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 very funny, but at the same time quite disturbing in the context. Isn't that? I'm, I'm just going to throw this in completely randomly because because I I, won't, I meant to put it early, but I can't. One little bit of wheel of tradition nobody has used since the Wolfman is the seasonal aspect of lycanthropy. Because, you know, spring, well, the, the seasonal aspect, because look, spring, summer, and winter, you're fine, but the autumn moon, you're buggered. <laughs> There's only the autumn moon, but in fact, not in, not in these movies, it's not. Well, that would be boring. Well, I, I understand <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. And actually, it actually doesn't even look like autumn in the film, as I remember it. Anyway. Now, uh, do we want to discuss are monsters more, or should we throw it open to the audience? Right. Well, Somebody less timid, come on, Lee, you ask a question. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Anyone got a question? question? Come on, you've got this amazing panel, some of you must have a question. You might want to ask something more general about monster movies, or about everybody's particular work or films. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I thought I might as well. Um, I, I, it's interesting, I think, that Ramsey talks about the werewolf um, being linked to the sort of cycles of the season. Because, you know, most obviously, particularly to the female audience member, He's very much a menstrual monster. Um, you know, and anyone that's been around or lived with a woman with PMS will probably, uh, you know, recognise the signs. Why do you think it is, you know, given the, the obviousness of that, that the only movie I can bring to mind that really addresses that through the werewolf is Ginger Snaps. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Well, I made a fairly crass comment on it in Long Soldiers. That was yeah. true. <laughs> very brief. Yeah. 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 But the Ginger Snaps obviously is like an entire movie. Oh. Well, I co-created a series called uh, She Wolf of London. A terrible series. But <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I wanted... the. Anybody else got a it's question? It's in Bristol. Huh. Yeah. I have a question for Reitz. Um, for in the League of Gentlemen, there's very many Royston Vasey-esque bits in the American Werewolf, like the statue, and when they're coming in on the road, it was just expecting to see the local shop. Um, how, how much yeah. were you, obviously, about I can't remember. <laughs> I think probably by osmosis there must have been, yeah. I mean, I didn't realise quite... Um, I think Brian Glover says there's nothing for you here. Yes. And I'm not, I don't think we got that from him, but I think that was with him. Yeah. Nothing for you here. I'll get out of here when they go to the, the tea rooms in Penrith. But, um, yeah, I, I, of course, it's that whole sequence of the slaughtered lamb and then arriving and everyone stopping and the dark board and everything. It's so, it feels like you've, it's, there's not a time when that hasn't existed, of course, but that it sort of is encapsulated in this, in this film that um, the locals not, you know, someone arriving and the locals not being too kind to them or being suspicious of them. So we completely ran with that idea with um, our local shop and there's certainly a, an element of um, the slaughtered lamb about the clubs and everything else, I guess. Uh, our August host just held up his hand, there was a pentagram on the path. <laughs> <laughs> pentagram on the path. Did John Carpenter just actually say my name? <laughs> I can't, can't, can't believe it, and I've been stuck on that since. Amazing. <laughs> what? Any, Any more questions, questions folks? Time, so, uh, keep it brief. Yeah, dead quick. You probably know far more than me anyway, but I just wondered why um, he didn't go back and make more horror movies. Made Innocent Blood quite yeah. 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 And Someone else did American Wife in Paris. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't remember that. The guy who did Mute Witness. He did oh. Masters of Horror. John did Masters of Horror, yeah. He, he did two episodes of Masters of Horror, uh, Dear Woman, which was written co-written by his son, Max, at the age of 19, the same age John was when he did uh, American Werewolf, and uh, an episode called Family that's really spectacular. So he never left the genre. I suppose there's also the thing that when you, you know, how do you top that? Yeah. <laughs> it's always going to be a problem. I you have one more question, but did you just say he was 19 when he... When he wrote it. When he wrote it. He wrote it in 1969. Yeah. Another question. Last one, I think. That's okay. Hi. Um, I remember the American Werewolf was particularly significant to me, apart from all the reasons that you've all discussed already, was it was the first werewolf film I saw where the monster was wolf-like and walked on all fours, as opposed to being the more humanoid upright. Um, what are your thoughts about, about that over like the last couple of minutes? <laughs> I, 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 I got into a little bit of bother with that one because I, I said, uh, I've been quoted several times as saying that um, as, as much as I love the transformation in that movie, I really did, didn't like the fact that it walked around on four legs. I preferred the werewolves and the howling walking around on two legs. I thought werewolf should be bipedal. And um, I ended up on, I visited the set, of, I visited Landis on set in London doing Burke and Hare. And I was sitting at the monitor and he came in and he said, oh, I want to introduce you to Rick. And I turned around and there's Rick Baker. I'd never met him before. And Rick just stares at me and says, you're the guy who said the werewolf should be on two legs and not four. And he held my stare for so long. And I was like, oh my God, total deer in the headlights. And eventually he said, I agree with you. <laughs> that was John's idea. And by the way, Rick really did not want the transformation to be shot in full daylight. That was something Landis insisted on, and Rick said, it's gonna look like rubber, it's not gonna look real. But he was insistent, and it works like gangbusters, and it changed the course of, of monster movie history. Can I ask a quick question? For all of us, what's your favorite part, shot, 
in the transformation sequence. Aside from the cutaway to Mickey Mouse. Uh, no, my favourite shot is the one where it opens its eyes and stares at the camera with the full werewolf eyes. Mine, I think, is on his back, where the spine comes through and the hair comes through. Yeah, yeah. Because mine's two is the heel stretching and the and the, and the hand stretching, that kind of. Mine is when he, he is on his back, but we his body is he's obviously through the floor and he's got that the, the long legs. Yeah, that's the best bit. That's like, that's the best bit. <laughs> You're all wrong. Yeah. It's really awkward looking and, and like painful and clumsy. I love that. Flops around. You see, these bastards have left me hardly any body parts. <laughs> I'm going to say the face, the face changing from human to, yeah, that's great. That's my favourite. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I always love the fact that he sets up the fact that he leaves the front door of the house open yeah. Yeah. to explain how he gets out of the house. But well, he strips off his clothes and he leaves both of the doors open <laughs> right the way through the transformation. He doesn't explain how he gets on the bus and pays for it with the rest of it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, guys, I think we have to wrap this up. Thank you very much. Give them all a round of applause.